Bad Boys for Life. Yeah, Bad Boys, Bad Boys. You ain't seen Bad Boys too. You don't even know Bad Boys. No, I've so. never seen Bad Boys. What up, Bad Boy? Hey, I'm not a bad boy. I'm a bad boy. Resand, Azrael, and Cassie and the other bad boys. That's if you know, you know. Yeah, if you know, you know. <laughs> Jay will know because I'm going to force That's him why. to read the audiobooks. Yes. But hey, welcome. Um, I'm actually talking about audiobooks. We're going to talk about audiobooks on this episode. Are you? Is that your name? That's my name. We're going to talk, talk about, about audiobooks books. on We're this gonna, episode. Yeah. No, I'm Jay. This is Jay. <laughs> if you listen to the last episodes, you'll know that I'm Jay. Yes. So today is a pretty fun one, a little bit of a mixed bag. <laughs> Definitely caters to Jay's interest and to my interest. So um, first up, we're going to have an interview with Zonta. Zonta. We're going to have You an- say his last name. We... I'll, I'll actually introduce him probably. Yeah, <laughs> I'll introduce, I guess, my half of the episode, which we had a fantastic interview with one of my gamer friends, uh, Zonta Ew, van der Goldberg. Gamer friend? Yeah, but my gamer friend, he is a cool fantastic, gamer friend. fantastic guy. He was, and he, we're so grateful that he jumped on um, to have a chat. He's a Moto Two World Championship rider. So cool. Very talented young guy, and yeah, we kind of picked his brains apart on how. Just, I guess, how his job works. Yeah, because we interviewed him right before his home race at Assen, which is really cool. Yeah. So as we're filming this, it is currently the weekend of his home race. Yeah. We would have liked to have this episode out earlier, but life's just been way too busy. It has been so hectic lately. It's crazy. Yeah. I yeah. think that's my good and my bad. Yeah. But I've been looking forward to releasing this episode because I think there's a lot of people... Um, who are who, and we and we have some fantastic listeners, some friends, some family, yes. and uh, some other the, folks out there on the, the interwebs. Feedback. All the feedback we've been getting yeah. so far has been so nice. Yeah, yeah so, so thank you all so much. Please let us know if you have any yeah. comments, queries, concerns, or a topic you want to hear. Or a topic. That's the whole point of the story of is we're just releasing the stories of yeah. cool things. <laughs> if you think there's a really cool thing that we should know about and do a pod about, like let us know because yeah. that is so fun. Well, so we're going to talk about. Oh, well, we're going to show the interview with Zonta van der Goorberg. Yeah. And you also... You've... And then we had a really cool um, bookish kind of thing happen. We went to a Rebecca Yaros kind of panel Q&A kind of talk thing, um, which is really cool. And we'll get onto that after mm. the Zonta kind of... Interview, interview so, yeah. Which it's more of a. I, we tried to set it out. Yeah, we tried to set it out as like a professional interview, or it's how I wanted it. But also, like, it's us. We just wanted yeah. to kind of chill as well. Which he was t- super on board for chilling. Um. So do we just yeah. cut straight into? I that? reckon we should. All right, let's travel. We'll to see that. you after. <laughs> what? Let's do it. All right. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, dude. Thank you again for um for jumping on and having a little chat. Um, no worries. Did you want to tell us a little bit about like your background and like growing up with bikes and and racing and things like that? Uh, well, I started riding bikes at a young age because of my dad, um, who was a former MotoGP rider. Um, so basically, as soon as I grew up, I was surrounded by bikes. Um, when I was around two and a half years old, I was for the first time on a motorbike. It was a small. Um, electric trials bike um so that's the first time i was uh, i was allowed to ride a bike um and then from there it just like obviously the it kept going uh, i did trials for a few years and i did some motocross and then when i was around 10 years old 11 years old i think i went um to a summer camp in Assen. It was a three-day event on the small track on the karting track and that's when I, for the first time, tried the um, was an NSF 100, so the first time a, a, um, a road bike. And from there, basically, I continued on road racing because I couldn't decide which one I liked more. Like uh, at such a young age, you don't realize the consequence of the decisions. You know, you're like, I, I don't care. Yeah, just they choose. Don't have a, you don't have fear my at parents, a young age. But, exactly. Yeah, I just said to my parents, like, ah, yeah, you decide. Like uh, for me, I like both. Obviously, thinking back now, it was obvious that they were going to choose road racing. Like, yeah, it's it's a stupid question uh, for me to ask them, but okay. And then I'll say, well, they decided road racing. 
And then from there, uh, I continued racing. The, the first season that, that I um, did road racing was NSF 100 Championship. And they had seven we, seven races, I think. Uh, so seven time, a one day event. Um, so we combined that still with the um, motocross, um, like a Dutch Championship, Open Dutch Championship. So there were some more nationalities. Uh, and that season started more early, so I was still doing that, and I was leading that championship. Um, but before the season, and also well in like the contract that you signed to ride that NSF Land Championship, uh, we agreed that if um, rounds would collapse, uh, like uh, collide, I would choose the racing. So then I did, but I was leading the Dutch Championship in motocross. And then I had to stop because the race season was starting, and then I said, ah, we cannot, we cannot do motocross anymore." Um, so yeah, that's basically like my story, how I how I started, and how you got into road racing, dude. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Who who would have ah. figured? It started with a uh, tiny little electric bike, and mm. and now you're on. Yeah. What are they? So six. 170 cc or something Seven, 765 765 oh. other way around there you go dude wow and that's crazy it's quite a funny story also like how i got my first bike because i don't know the name in english but the the thing that the kid has in the mouth you know like the like the dummy uh, the pacifier? like the baby i don't know yeah like the baby has a yeah yeah um so i had to give that um away for the bike like oh. as a kid you love this and, but I had no choice. Like they said, oh, or you keep this or you get the bike. And I was crying. Like I wanted both, but then I eventually gave in and I gave that and then I got my bike. Which, Jumped uh, on the bike. I love that. That's a, well, that's, that's a, so... that's a good trade. Surely you don't regret that trade now. <laughs> nah, now no. But I think at the time I was upset. I was crying. Like, fuck. Of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, no, for sure. Does it, uh, so we're heading into what the, TT Assen circuit, which is your home circuit, and does that feel any different to other races? Or, well, obviously people think that you have a home advantage, um, but I haven't rode there since the last GP. Oh, um, yeah. So, in if anything, I have a disadvantage because people expect more, and with with expectations, all you can do is is disappoint. Because if if there's no expectation, you cannot disappoint. If there's expectations, you can disappoint. Um, and also people think, ah, like, uh, it's your home GP, so you ride there a lot, or you have ridden there a lot in the past, but I haven't ridden there since the last GP. So actually the guys that are racing again, 80% has done more track time there than me, because I've only done two GPs there, and they have yeah. done maybe already 10 GPs, so they've got a lot more track experience than me. Yeah, right. Um, obviously a bit different with the, with the media and stuff that comes um quite a lot more attention more fans more friends coming mm. um but you try to approach it as much as a normal weekend you know if you start to think and treat it as a different weekend that's not how it should be every every weekend you try you try your best and it's not like it's the home gp that you try something extra not impossible like every race you're on the limit so it's yeah you should treat it like uh, like uh, every other weekend yeah definitely yeah cool definitely um yeah i suppose what's been um for you what's been like a standout or like the best moment of your whether it's your whole like moto racing career or just even moto twos it's yeah open question what's been your best moment um, your well i you? would think i have i have two moments one is in moto two was last year mm -hmm. um the india and japan races they were back to back and i got sixth and ninth they were nice and then actually Indonesia following up also. Indonesia was actually my best weekend, but unfortunately I had a mechanical in the race. Otherwise, I think I could have really challenged there for maybe even a top five. Um, that was probably my best weekend. But anyway, results-wise, uh, in the race, uh, India and Japan, the back-to-back -back weekends, they were, they were uh, amazing, to say the least, with uh, P6 and P9. Um, and another moment that always stands out when I think about my racing career was in... 2020 when i was riding in the european talent cup and i won uh well i topped every session and i won all three races in the european talent cup in aragon um that's always still something if i see pictures of it it's still an amazing memory because i was riding against super fast guys like um 
I was fighting against Alonso, and then I finished second in the championship, and he won the championship. Uh, David Alonso, and if you see now how fast he is in Model Three, you know it's not it's not like you were riding against bad guys. Um, so yeah, that's that's always a yeah. That's probably even my my best my best memory that I that I have. I suppose that brings up a another question that I've always wondered. Like, so you've taken sort of a different path, not going straight from you know, Talent Cup or the general path of going Talent Cup to Moto Three. Yeah. Um, so you've gone from Talent Cup straight up to Moto Two. Was there something there that pulled you towards that? Was it the local team, or was it you know something? Um, well, um, personal decision was it? <laughs> well, mostly personal. Like, um, well, you've seen me. I'm quite, I'm quite tall, and 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 even with still my young age now, I'm still the youngest Moto Two rider. Many people forget that, but I'm still the youngest in the class. But I'm one of the tallest. Um, <laughs> And in Model 3, that, that can be quite a disadvantage. Like, okay, there's some guys in Model 3 that are tall, but they are, like, really skinny. But I'm not, I'm not super, super skinny, okay? I'm, uh, I'm not the, the biggest guy. Um, but in Model 3, it could have been a little disadvantage. I was actually meant to go to Model 3 um, with the Sepang Racing Team uh, that existed at that time, but then out of nowhere uh patronas pulled out. well i don't know where uh, stuff happened and then patronas pulled out and then we had no seat um and then this opportunity came to go to rw in motor 2 um and it's you you cannot say no like mm. i remember at the time uh, i was 15 uh, i was sitting at the dinner table in our old house uh with my mother my father and my uncle um who's also a former uh gp rider and um yeah they were like yeah yeah do you want to do you want to do it and i wasn't sure like i didn't think it would be the the best thing to do obviously in the end i don't regret it uh, at all i'm i'm really happy with where i am now um but also me at the start i was a bit shocked like oh it's not the the usual thing to do and it can be quite a big step um but i think in the end we we, we made it work um definitely it was it was well the step was made easier for it to be a dutch team but there is no the only thing dutch in the team is the team manager like uh the team manager and my father they knew each other already um so to make the first contact it was easy um but like there's no mechanics or not that is dutch you know that's that's something that the people people are mistaken quite a lot yes yeah um did you have a question? Do you want to... Well, my... I feel like you have so far. So I'm just like, oh. <laughs> no, I've just been listening. I'm fascinated by all this kind of stuff. So, um, my thing was like, what's your favorite part about being a world champ, like a Moto Two rider? Is there something that's specific that every time you kind of do it, you go, "I get to do this. That's cool." Like, um, well, there is there is good things and bad things. Um, but also some things are good and bad. For example, um, one of the things that immediately shoots to mind is that you get to see amazing places. Mm. Uh, uh, like I've been to Australia. Like why would <laughs> why why would I go to Australia normally? It yeah. wouldn't happen. Uh, maybe I would go one time in my life, but not not every year, you know. Um, but then the bad thing is the traveling. So yeah. it's like yeah. the nice part is traveling, but also the bad part is the traveling um like you spend sometimes like um 30 hours 35 hours non-stop traveling from hotel to hotel from hotel to hotel and mm -hmm. can be exhausting but then again you get to see amazing things that normal boys of my age they don't get to see yeah um obviously it's it's well especially now it's my it's my third year in this team and some members have changed but it's mostly stayed the same and it's like a, it's like a second family um like literally it's uh, every time you you see them you have a laugh and it's it's super nice to be with them so it's you you create special bonds uh inside the uh, inside the panic with your team or other members who are working somewhere else whatever other riders um so that's also one of the one of the nice things um and obviously riding the bike is it's something special you get to ride machinery that um i think many people in the world would love to try um one day and you get to do it for a living you know it's yeah uh, you 
you get to um, do what you love most uh, and make a living out of it. Well, hopefully. Yeah, yeah that's definitely. so cool. It's it's got to be it's got to be a strong bond you guys share, like traveling the world together yeah. and you know all there yeah. for the same purpose and just yeah. so it has many to be because spots, yeah. Like if if you don't like uh, the people in in your team or the people that you're traveling with, whatever, it's not gonna work. Like you you spend so much time together with each other. Um, I see them more than my own family. Like yeah, I see my definitely. mechanics, I see them more than my own father or my own mother or sister or whatever. Um, so yeah, if if you don't like each other, then you then you have a problem. <laughs> yeah, you'll definitely. know about it quick. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, this one is actually from one of our viewers and a good friend of mine, which you would have met when you came to Australia and we caught up, which was very nice. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's asked. Um, it might be a hard question. Uh, so yeah, his his question was, uh, what is most important to you as a rider to best be able to focus on improvement over the season? Is it like you have to get in the right headspace to um, like, let's say you're down the track or whatever. You, is it clearing all the distractions, getting rid of you know social media and even just media in general? Is it focusing on your physical fitness, going for your bike rides, things like that? What what's most important to you to improve? Both are super important, physically and mentally. Um, but arguably, mentally, it's even more important than physically. Like, um, especially in Moto2, it's the class that is the closest with lap times. Um, also, that shows the level, the level of the class. Um, but if you are P15, um, you can be on three tens. Um, and those three tens, it's almost nothing. Like um a, a, an extra hour on the bicycle is not going to change those three tens um but you yourself you can change those those three tens you know what i mean yeah. um obviously physically it's it's really important to be to be fit and i would argue that model two it's one of the most physical classes like if you see for example the amount of arm pimp surgeries that have happened just alone this year in model two i don't know the exact count but i think more than 10 riders out of the 30 have done arm procedure this year, and for some it's the second time or whatever. But like more, more than ten different ones have done it already this season. And in MotoGP, it's only Rolf Fernandez, and in Moto3, it's no one. Um, but it just shows how physically Moto2 is now, and arguably even more now with the Pirellis. Um, it seems like that with a little bit more grit that we have, we can push it a little bit more. And with the way that you need to ride the Moto2, it's it's quite a strange way. Um, and obviously, the, well, the chassis is really stiff and whatever. Um, it seems like there's a lot of physical strength on the body. Um, but like I said, also mentally, it's important. The start of this year, I wasn't feeling so well. And you can see it in the results. Like I started well in Qatar and Portimao and America were uh, difficult. And then afterwards, it went uh, better and better again. Um, so it's definitely a mix of both. Um, but also, obviously, on the track, like you need to keep improving the setup um, to make steps. We're definitely still looking. Like we've, well, it's clear also to the outside world that we've still not got a dial in. Um, like if you look many times uh, at the start of the weekend in the in the first practice, I'm outside of the top twenty. Um, just because we start with well, a kind of a wrong base. Um, just because we're still we're still searching for for that one thing that is working. Um, and maybe there's teams that have found something. Maybe there's teams like us that are maybe still looking for something or riders. Um, but that's all new things, especially now with the with the new tires that came in. Yeah, indeed. And even even looking when you mentioned your results before, it just reminded me like even looking at your results from your first season and then looking through, it's just ever gotten closer and closer to the front. You know, it's it's really cool to see yeah. that progression. You're doing yeah, fantastic. Definitely. So you got to be proud of that. That's for sure. like, like the goal to to get closer and closer and so far it's working like uh last season i got two time in the points and okay it should have been a little bit more with a mechanical in indonesia and a mechanical in thailand uh, when i was going uh when i should have had points uh, two more times um but even with even without that like i only had points two times and this year i've already had five times i think four times five times uh out of seven races so yeah it just shows that we are getting much much closer yeah you and the team got to be 
very proud of that. And talking about improvement, um, <laughs> so I guess, yeah, we kind of met through like video games, GP bikes <laughs> and that. Um, now, this is more of a question to keep my hopes up of being a Moto2 <laughs> rider. But in your opinion, do video games like GP bikes or MotoGP or whatever, um, do they offer any benefit to your riding, whether it's learning new tracks or whatnot or new lines? I don't know if you noticed, but lately I've not been playing a lot at all. <laughs> um, it's been going quite well, you know, the last few races. So I don't think it changes much. Like maybe, maybe if I start to do it now, maybe I get a lot better. <laughs> uh, maybe it's the win, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, keep his dreams alive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, try. Still hope. Still hope. Uh, well, I think they, this sometimes can be nice. Um, for example, maybe for example, if we go to if if we go to Kazakhstan, uh, to learn a completely new track, uh, but not really like breaking markers or something like that, just to learn the layout and maybe some lines. Um, I wouldn't say MotoGP because well, just the physics are a little bit too arcadey. Yeah. Uh, GP bias comes a bit closer, but also there, you know, it's, it's can be a bit, <laughs> buggy, yeah. a bit iffy at times. Um, but well, I guess it can be nice sometimes. I remember um, in well, when was it? Must have been for my first season, uh, very first season in Moto2, and then I played um, GP bikes on Argentina for the race weekend and that race weekend was amazing yeah. i got into q2 in my second race weekend in model 2 and i crashed in the race otherwise i would have gotten points um so then from there i i need yeah. to play every time yeah. for the week now like it works no um so yeah i it's i guess sometimes it can work but in generally no like you already know so much about most tracks and that's the thing that's the difference between riders at our level model 2 model gp and even riders already in 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 other uh, high level championships, let's say even uh, junior GP or something, like we are fast from lap one. Like mm -hmm. in sometimes you see that in lap two or three they already uh, they already put a lap time that at the end of the session it's still competitive, and even in high level junior classes you don't see this. Um, yeah, it's it's just something that, that you have to do as a yeah. uh, as a as a as a world championship rider. Like you have no choice, but it's definitely one of the one of the things that you really need to adapt to. Um, I remember uh, a good friend of mine he did a wild card in Supersport Six Hundred um, uh, in Assen, and he asked me before the weekend like, uh, "How do you go so fast from lap one? How do you do it? I, I need to know because uh, I I want to do it this weekend, but." I don't know how you how how you do it. Like, what do you prepare or whatever you know? Uh, um, so yeah, it's it's maybe it can help, but it's more fun than uh, than actually useful. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Maybe I shouldn't day, say maybe. this because my listen to this, and next time I want to play, and you say, yeah. ah, it's useless. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's not... <laughs> you watch all the all the UK lads. They're gonna they're gonna like that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um... And so was it your uncle or your your father that rode in like MotoGP back in the day? Was it... um, my father rode in MotoGP and I'm not actually sure. I know my uncle rode GPs for sure, 250 for sure. Um, I wouldn't put my money on if he rode 500, I think, but I don't know. I'm really not sure. Maybe I don't think a full season, but maybe like a race or something. But two fifty, yes. Yeah. And my father rode five hundred for sure. Yeah, definitely. That's um, so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, did you? Yeah, I was. I mean, I was just thinking like, if if you had one motorbike, whether it's a you know race bike or or anything, out of any year, any size, whatever, well, even if like you don't have the ability to ride it now, like what what bike would it be? Yeah. <laughs> Well, probably like we just said, the 500, I would love to try it one day. Like, mm. of all the bikes I can say, like, I can say, uh, I don't know, like a, a Ducati 1000 or something, but it's all quite similar to what we write now. Like, I have an R1 and, you know, it's it's all similar to each other. Um, so I, do, I think all the bikes would be 500 because, well, they are more or less impossible to ride nowadays. And sometimes you see like a demo run, but nobody pushes it anymore. Like, uh 
you nowadays you see nobody go to to a track there something on the 500 and yeah rip its balls off you know now never um so i would i would love to try to try one of them nowadays and maybe also to see like because you see the, the styles in the past were a lot different um with the way they were well pushing the bike and we are leaning off the bike it's completely different and like if i speak to my father about that about that he says why well, it's just the probably a lot to do with the tires something with the suspension but i would love to try like if a rider like me or anybody else nowadays would try 500 with the way it was set up back then if we would ride it the way that they did or if we would ride it the way that we are riding bikes nowadays with the elbow out and whatever you know i would yeah i think it would be interesting to see um why they rode that way back then and why we ride why we ride this way now yeah that's yeah. pretty cool i have a question do you have a um do you have a road license like do you have a bike that you ride just outside of no i don't no, no i have a don't? i have a i have a car license yeah. um and the moped license but that's all um i eventually do want to get my bike license uh but then the netherlands is a bit of a hassle like you have three different ones and the first one you can get at 18 and you can only ride up to 300 cc i think yeah um then the next one you have to wait until i don't know 21 and you can ride it to 600 and i think at 24 you can get the one that you can ride any bike that you want um so i want to wait until i'm uh that age that i can immediately get the full one um not really to buy a bike myself like i don't want to ride on the road i uh, i have no no purpose in that like it will just be boring also like uh, yeah. if it's right i just want to be comfortable in my car you know uh, yeah. um but it's more like if you ever need to help someone out or like transport something or maybe um some uh, i don't know uh, for a company that they want you to to shoot some things on the road it can always be nice to have it Exactly. So it's more just to have it in case than to actually ride the bike myself on the road. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure riding, you know, 40, what, well, I don't know if you guys have miles per hour or Ks, I don't know, but 40 Ks down the road and then it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, you can go 250 down the Asset exactly. Strait or it's whatever. Like, yeah. or you want to be in the car, put the music on and enjoy, you know, exactly. like, I don't need to be on the bicycle. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, obviously we talked a little bit about, uh, yeah, you're at your home Grand Prix and I just wanted to kind of set the stage for this question. <laughs> this one is a very experimental question in my, in my books, but right. So you've done the warm up lap, you're pulling up to your, yes. your grid position, which is going to be on the front row. We know <laughs> no, I don't want to put that pressure on you. That's all, that's all your job, but the helmet goes on, you're staring at turn one, it's set up, set off the lap what's going through zonta's mind well first of all down. like nowadays with the way, because we don't have a warm-up anymore we always do two laps to arrive to the grid you know do one lap pass through pit lane and then they're up to the grid um and like in the past they used to be warm-up laps like you would push but not really you know like it would just, uh, be like a normal pace lap nowadays you arrive to the grid sweating like hell you push like hell in those first two laps because it's the only two laps that you have to get some sort of feeling and you immediately need to be like like turned on to the maximum because the moment you start because the the lap from the to the grid it's slow like everybody's waiting and looking and so in that lap you can do nothing um so in those two laps to the grid is the only two laps that you have before the start of the race and you need to be completely turned on you need to be very to the maximum to fight like like hell uh, especially the first lap always is chaos you know so in the past it used to be well uh, a, a normal lap nowadays like you arrive to the grid and you're already tired oh, like those, those two laps they are killing um also that's quite surprising like that nobody's like crashed yet in those two laps and if somebody will crash people will take the piss out of the rider that's crashed, but it's really not strange if it will happen because we are pushing like it's like it's mm. qualifying, you know, or like like we, we try, we, yeah, we really try. So if, yeah, if somebody ever crashes on that lap, like, yeah, for sure you will see a lot of comments about it, but it won't really, it will, I, I wouldn't doubt that it will happen sometime in the season. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, then you pull up to the grid. Um, <laughs> many time I take my, take my helmet off 
uh, my gloves off, um, open the suit, put the chest protector away just to get some air flowing, you know. Uh, and then many time I have uh, my crew chief holding my uh, holding my umbrella up. Um, I don't have a good girl, unfortunately. Uh, it's just not, yeah. Is there applications there? I'll, I'll put my. Jay will be astral. a good girl in, in <laughs> Australia. <laughs> And it's really probably be raining, so I'll just have to like protect me from the rain. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jay's got long arms. He yeah. Can... <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, well, you just you just like try to get in the zone, you know. Like uh, I don't uh, listen to any music or something on the grid. Um, I just have my earplugs in from the well, like the earplugs from the from the riding, and I don't take them out. That's I still hear surrounding sounds, but it all quiets it down a little bit. Uh, many, well, in the European races, um, I always have a great interview with Ziggo, the Dutch broadcaster uh, um, of the Netherlands. Um, so they always do a quick interview, like uh, one question and finish you know, so one minute and uh, that's all. And from there, you, you have um, seven minutes, eight minutes until it's, uh, until it's goal time, you know? Um, so you just try to to focus um don't think about things too much try to try to relax but i like to be quite um quite angry quite not not mm, not like tense aggressive? tense is not the right word but yeah like aggressive yeah. Yeah. um like well before i go on the bike many people look at me really strange if i do it but before on the bike always i scream not like ah but like like rah, like yeah. aggressive, yeah. like yeah. fuck! I'm, I'm gonna do this, and I and I smash the floor, give my mechanics a fist bump, and I go on the track. Um, people that don't know this, like from other boxes or guests or something, like they always get shocked, you know, because <laughs> out of nowhere somebody is just like like screaming. So they also <laughs> uh, my mechanics know it nowadays, you know, so they 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 don't think it's like uh, they don't get shocked by it anymore. Um, so yeah, you just try to to get focused. Um, then with about three minutes to go, four minutes to go, you put back the helmet, put back the gloves. Um, I never wait until the last moment to do that. You know, imagine something is wrong or whatever. I prefer to it have it on two minutes out. early than <laughs> uh, don't stress, you know. Um, and then it's, it's starting a bike and always that's still a thing. Like, fuck, these mono two bikes, they're get to start and they are almost impossible to get into neutral well when you want them to go on neutral mm -hmm. uh, on the track they go on neutral every corner but for example uh, <laughs> in the box you cannot get it on neutral um so they start the bike you're already happy when you hear your bike running because imagine it doesn't start mm -hmm. then many times the mechanic put the stand back on um like the mechanic of the rear wheel put the stand back on and then uh, the main mechanic the one of the front wheel he tries to put my bike in neutral. Um, sometimes it works, also sometimes it doesn't. So then you are just waiting on the grid uh, from like the lap from grid to grid with the clutch in the hand. Uh, so it's, that's not not nice, you know, because it's not good for the clutch. And also imagine you, you stole the bike. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. And then, like I said, on that lap from the grid to the grid, it's, yeah, people are just uh, looking everywhere and that lap is just uh, more or less bullshit. Um, you try to keep the you try to keep the tires clean, like especially at the end of the lap, like you don't want to take a strange line because if you go completely out of the track, like uh, for example Mugello, if in the last corner you go completely out on the paint, yeah, when you arrive to turn two, uh, the first lap, your left side will not be correct, you know. Uh, also, if it's cold, if it's cold, then it's more important the lap, like you um, need to try to keep the tires in a, in a good window when it's hot, it's less important. Um, but when it's hot, it's more important for the bike temperature. So you don't want to arrive first to the grid uh, because the bike temperature will skyrocket. Also, on the lap to the grid, you want to keep the temperature as low as possible. Like you're not gonna go maximum revs everywhere and get the temperature up because it changes a lot. Like already 10 degree on the engine, uh, for example, 70 degree or 80 degree, you feel a complete difference in power, uh, especially when starting the bike. When actually on the track, it's not so much difference. But when when you are making a practice start and the bike is 70. Or you have been waiting a while and the bike is 80. It's 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 a completely different way of starting the bike. Um, so yeah, that's the main thing that you are thinking about. And then uh, obviously you're pulling up to the grid. Um, 
I don't know why, but I count in English. I count the grid slots in English. Like, for example, if I'm um, a P12 on the grid, um, because I'll see the roads are not like um, all behind each other, you know, like it's um, there is always a, a row in the middle that's a little bit off center. Yeah. Um, so if you're 12, it'd be 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, 42. So when you pull up and you see 42, you know that you're in the correct row. And then you see 42, 36, 30, 24, 18, 12. And then you stop at 12. I don't know why I count that in English, but <laughs> I do. Yeah. yeah, I cannot tell why. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then just before you're about to re release the clutch to set off for the race, what's what's uh? What's going through your mind nah, through the race? What? Not much, not much thinking <laughs> not at that much. point. It's just like, get the job you put, done. You put the lap control on, and you're revving, revving, revving. Put well, like the the guy is there with the flag. The guy walks away. Put the you engage uh, first gear. Uh, at that point, you already put the launch control on because you put that on as soon as you arrive to the grid. Um, actually, also one time I forgot that I forgot <laughs> to put the launch control. Yeah, uh, it was I think last year. And actually, my start wasn't bad. I had still a really good start. So I was lucky, but yeah, uh, you put the launch control, the guy walks away with the flag, you put first gear, you start to rev, like just uh, not constant rev, but uh, like open the gas, like hum, hum, hum. and then as soon as the the red lights come on, uh, you put full gas, um, and then as soon as they go off, you try to react as quick as possible. That's basically all you think about as soon as you arrive to the grid, like I have to react as soon as possible. Um, Nowadays, actually, even with Pirelli, sometimes um, on the uh, when you arrive to the to the grid, you try to look some tires, but it's hard to see. You know, like many times, uh, you can only see of the guy left in front of you. Like all the others, you cannot really see because you have the sticker uh, of the color, and then you can see the compound. For example, I remember in Barcelona, I looked at the guy left of me to see which tire he had, but I couldn't see it because it was just behind the swing arm. Uh, um, Is that yeah, just to make sure you've oh. picked the right? Yeah, or just see what everyone well, else has. Like, so. Yeah, like it yeah. can be nice. For example, if you if you do end up with that guy, you know which tire he has, and then you can like uh, if he has the softer one and he's with you, then you can maybe think, ah, at the end of the race, I will have him because yeah. the soft tire will run out, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, use it to your advantage. That's very exactly. good. Man. Well, um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Well, thank you so much for uh, for jumping on, man. It's, of it's it's been fantastic, and yeah, we hope you. Uh, have a great time back home and hopefully yep. you get a chance to rest before hopefully. the uh before the race and yeah. yeah we wish you luck man and we'll, for the rest of the season we'll be watching <laughs> yeah we'll be watching will you be in for the uh we won't be so yeah, we, maybe we actually moved up to queensland so yeah yeah huh. i'll be in i'll be uh -huh. in italy when you're in italy but i'll be on the other side i'll be in rome <laughs> so oh. yeah. you told me that yeah oh. yeah so um, we'll see. There. We'll see how the funds are for Phillip Island because it's just before Jay's birthday as well. So. Yeah. Oh, maybe you get a birthday gift from the girlfriend. Yeah, maybe. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, fingers crossed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> birthday we'll gift is being your grid girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How's that? Huh? <laughs> All right, man. Too easy. Well, good. thank you so much, dude. Um, have a, have of course. a great time, man. No it's, it's um, yeah, that was. I brilliant. wish you a good night. Yeah. Thank well. you. Yeah, we wish you a good day, <laughs> I guess. And, dinner and sleep. <laughs> have a good lunch. Yeah, yeah. yeah have, a, have a good dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, awesome, man. Thank you so much. And yeah, best of luck for the rest. Bye, man. Cheers. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye. Catch you, buddy. Bye. Okay, welcome back. Um, Yo. I hope you just listened to the whole Zonta interview because there was some gold in there. There, yeah, there was certainly like, some awesome part. But did you have a fair part? I, mean, I know that we're record <laughs> We're currently <laughs> recording this a week after we filmed the interview with him. But do you have a favorite part? Well, I think I think my favorite part was when you kept looking at me, being like, "Do you want to ask the next question? Do you want to talk about something?" But I was just so intrigued by all of his answers. I was happy to just sit there and listen. Yeah, and just like I was just sitting there going. No, that's so cool. Damn. Whoa. I would never would have thought about that. Um, but yeah, I think I think just the way he mentally goes about the racing is just such mm. a cool thing. Yeah, I think the whole thing as a experience was really cool. Like, because we, or well, the few times that we play games, we just talk about games. <laughs> so and that, and that apparently I don't exist, which I think he can finally put to bed. I do exist. Yes. yes. Um. Um, they didn't. Yes. They didn't think I had a real girlfriend. No. <laughs> online, those guys. 
that group of friends. But anyway, but yes. uh, I liked the part where he explained that all the Moto2 riders start at like 100%, 110% effort as soon as they get out the gate because all the bikes are the same. Well, very, very similar. Yeah. And they're all like trying to compete for that number one spot and it's all within a margin of a tenth of a whatever. Like, mm. yeah, that was really cool to hear that they just come out swinging straight away. And he's like, yep, you've got to be at your fastest as soon as you step on the bike, yeah, and it's which like, that's what makes the greatest ride. And, like, that's why the first lap is so hectic yeah. in every race because everyone is just going so full out in the very first Literally. race, like, in the very first lap. And he was just – he was simply just like, because you've got no choice. That yeah, was so cool, which to. you guys would have just heard. Yeah. Which um, is – yeah. My other favourite part is that I didn't realise he was still the youngest Moto2 rider, even yeah. though he's been in it for two years. Two years he's been in it? Yeah, and one thing we didn't – yeah, he's been oh, – well, this is his third year. Kind yeah, of. and he's still the youngest, and which is crazy. You know what's – really cool so he's turned 18 this year but there was a rule that was put in this year that if you weren't 18 you couldn't join so he joined when he was like 16 wow yeah and someone can correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty certain they came up with a rule just this year that was like all right anyone under 18 can't join motor 2 but he was 17 when they brought the rule in how weird is that because he was already in it it yeah. was just like from any new particip- that's cool yeah it's pretty cool so yeah so he's like an anomaly very, yeah very talented young lad and yeah thank you so much for zonto for jumping on yeah can't wait to hopefully finally meet you in person this yeah, year yeah that'll be cool so hopefully we can go down to moto gp it'll be quite a squeeze because we've got a lot of things going on in the second half yeah. of this year but he didn't have a fun time there the first time he came and we met him no when you guys met him yeah. he crashed he crashed on like his first lap out broke his wrist and so we got to quickly catch up for a minute before I think he flew back. Somewhere. Yeah, they as soon as and yeah. I didn't realize that either. Like, if you kind of crash out and injure yourself and you can't do the rest of the weekend, they'll just change your flight. Yeah, they just it's not like you get up. to hang around the park, like the yeah. circuit or anything, for the next two days. They're like, no, nope, go home, rest. Yeah, go home, like, recover, fly out quickly. straight away. It's crazy. Yeah, it's so I nuts. didn't think it was that. Like, I thought you'd be able to hang out for the rest of the weekend. So much tra- and I think that was really cool to hear him say, like, because everyone's like, oh, I want a job where I can travel. Yeah. Even myself, I've now got a job where I can travel. But for someone that does it every weekend or every few weekends. Crazy. He's just like, I'm sick of the travel. What, like <laughs> nine months out of a year? Yeah. And yeah. It, and like I loved hearing about his found family as well. With yeah, the, that's really cool. With like, you know, you travel with these people nine months out of the year. So yeah. you've yeah. you've got to like them. Yeah. You see them more than your own family. Yeah. It's so, very cool. Yeah. But yeah, so you would yeah. have just heard all that. But um, I think it's very interesting. And I would yeah. love to have a conversation with... Anyone else, like, maybe one day get Jack Miller on the podcast. Ooh, Wouldn't that be cool? That would be cool. Uh, fingers dream crossed. Big, dream big. Jack, we're rooting for dream you big. because yes. you've nearly got a seat, I guess, hopefully. Oh, we're fingers crossed. Our Aussie. Um, yeah. yeah, so definitely big, like, kind of MotoGP yeah. heavy start to the episode. But yeah. we are going to hard right turn. Like, we are going to hook turn. Yes. For the rest of the episode. For the rest of the episode. We're going to cater to the nerds. And Hey, I'm you guys not a are, nerd. I'm a book fan. <laughs> I'm a book nerd. <laughs> Sorry, this, this, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of this episode is going to be very bookish. So I just wanted to do my humble brag of um, I've now got a signed fourth wing book. Yeah. I've got one too. No, I forfeited mine to a friend of Ashley's. But If, if you're watching... The video you can see my yeah, signed book boom. right there. <gasps> Fourth wing. Oh, that's gonna be the that's oh gonna be God. the thumb thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> um. So we went to Brisbane uh, after work one day this week, and we went to it's like a kind of like a, a talk with a Q and A at the end of Rebecca Yaros, who is the author of the Empyrean series, which is Fourth Wing and Iron Flame and the upcoming Onyx Storm, and it was so good. It was great. Like, being able to listen to what goes through her brain when she's writing things mm-hmm. and everything like that, absolutely amazing. Because I've read some of her other books, not just her fantasy novels. I've read some of her contemporary novels. Novels? Novels? Novels. Um, novels, and they are so good. I read a, like The Things We Leave Unfinished, and that broke okay. me. Yes. Like I remember it was just... It was, what, what's, this, uh, what's that book about? So, it's oh, hang on. I have I'm just gonna have I to have get no the blurb up for you because it's gonna be so much easier. I have no idea about her books, but it was a fantastic chat. And you can see, I was I was mentioning this to a friend of mine today. I was saying you can see that she's just 
getting along that, getting used to the, I guess, celebrity life. And she was kind of awkward coming out and it's like, oh, hey, guys, like, what's up? Yeah, she's, I think she's, like, in disbelief that – because it because Fourth Wing did pop off so quickly. Yeah, it was astronomically like quick. Absolutely crazy. So um, the fact that it popped off so quickly, I feel like it's she still hasn't caught up to yeah. – it wasn't like a slow build of getting excited. It was like all of yeah. a sudden she was – instead of just – being in her house, wish, hoping that a book's going to sell, she's doing these tours of yeah. conversations and stuff. So um, the synopsis kind of for the things we leave unfinished is there's two sworn enemies, one unfinished manuscript, and the love story of a lifetime is what it's called, is the kind oh. of the tagline. So it just it, it kind of has two alternative timelines. Right. Um, that it kind of flips back between, which is like a daughter and her grandma, and then her grandmother, um, where like she realizes her grandmother didn't finish her last romance book, and she's a novelist, and oh, so uh. she's determined to share her story, but it needs to be written. So it's kind so of it's like a book a, about someone who writes books. So no, so it's a book about so like her grandmother wrote novels, yeah, and so she sees that she didn't get to finish her last novel and she wants to finish it. Okay. And right. like do it justice. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, That makes sense. That's really cool. But yes. So it's. So that one's really good. Amazing. There's a few other Rebecca Yarrow's books that I have finished. I'm working my way through her whole catalog, but um, she said a few things about Onyx Storm, which is the third book in the Empyrean series. It comes out in January. I have already pre-ordered my special edition with the painted spine. I'm so excited. It's, oh my God. So she, we were asked of um, three words to prepare us for Onyx Storm. And she said, you're not ready. And I'm so worried because like mm. this girl or this woman is so good at cliffhangers and like crazy plot twists and storylines and stuff like that, that it's, it's just going to be crazy. It sounds like it's going to be a good, good read regardless. Yeah. So um, one of my – so the first contemporary Rebecca Yarrow's book that I read that wasn't Fourth Wing. So I read Fourth Wing. I went straight on, read Iron Flame as soon as Iron Flame came out. Um, and then I read her first – like the first contemporary that I read from her is called In the Likely Event. Um, and I started reading that on a flight from Gold Coast to Melbourne. It's two hours. And at the very start of the book, there's a plane crash. Whoa. And I was on the plane and I was like, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> so oh my crazy. Um, and that book is says, it says, Nate goes on to a career in the military while Izzy finds her way into politics. Despite a few chance encounters over the years, the timing never feels right. Then comes a high stakes reunion in Afghanistan where Nate is tasked to protect Izzy's life and he'll do anything to keep her safe. So it's these two people they meet because they're sitting next to each other on a plane mm. and they're holding like they're completely strangers on these on this plane sitting next to each other and one is afraid of flying. Right. And they have the conversation of, oh well, the first five minutes of the flight and the last it's five the minutes dangerous. are the most dangerous. Oh my God. So he sets an alarm on his watch. For five minutes, and they go. All right, we're gonna we're gonna do this together. We'll both count this five minutes down, and the plane crashes. What in the oh first five minutes? Why would you do that? In yeah, the first yeah, right, five minutes. Okay. So they have to survive this plane crash. They all survive. Oh, it's all fine. Dude. Like it's fine. They make an emergency landing in water, um, and it's all fine. But then, yeah, there was like this just this chance encounter that they're next to each other for this plane crash. And then throughout the years, they just run into each other. But the timing's never right. It's one of those right, right person, wrong time situations. Yes. And yeah. it happens a few times. But that is a, that's a beautiful book. Do they fall in love? They do. Aw, how did like, I get? But like, that's just a romance. It's a yeah, contemporary yeah, exactly. romance. <laughs> that's, like, what I'm saying. that's what you're um, asking. And I think it was very interesting that Rebecca Yaros says she, in between each of her fantasy books, she will write a contemporary romance. That's pretty cool. To kind of ground herself again. Which is a hell of a lot of writing, surely. Oh, it is crazy. This mm. woman, I swear she does not sleep. Yeah. Because she released Iron Flame last September, I think it was. And then she's got another book releasing next month that she wrote in between Iron Flame. And then she's just submitted, 
she's doing the first round of edits for this new contemporary book, which is called Variations, which I'm very excited to read. Um, the blurb that she told us the other night sounds great. Um, yeah. And then she's just submitted the first draft of Onyx Storm because it releases in January, which is insane. And we're yeah. like, girl, you need to sleep. Because she was talking about at one point she was talking about how she was – it was right – before the deadline of Onyx Storm and she was put, like didn't sleep for like 48 hours. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like authors are just on a whole new level. Yeah. I but swear. This um yeah, the the whole forum was really cool. Like they they come in and sit down, they had all these interviews and everyone got to s- submit their own questions and I think some of the questions were fantastic. I was sad that there was only 15 minutes of question time at the yeah. end. I oh, wish, they like, stretched that out a bit though. No, they did, they but they out. still only answered like three or four questions yeah, from the audience. It, fe- it felt like that, but some of the questions were like she was also making up and she had some good ones that she made up as well, yeah, the, so the interviewee. Well, the, the interviewer, interviewer, the interviewer is was also the- <laughs> an author. I'm so tiger. Yes. Yeah, we're recording this quite late at night. Um, so the interviewer was author, author, also an, an author. Um, <laughs> let me get her name's Lynette, Lynette Noni, maybe. Yeah. It was her name, and I'm interested to read some of her books as well because it seems very interesting. Yeah. Um, I think it was pretty cool though that. Where is her name? I think yeah, it taught- is Lynette Noni. Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty cool that I shared a cute little thing on my Instagram story of us at the event and after the event, Rebecca Yaros liked it. You guys are basically like best friends. Man. We are best friends. I can't wait for you to like go to the house and have I wish we breakfast. could have our wedding again so we could invite her. Oh, uh, we definitely will next time. <laughs> what? <laughs> We're not having another wedding. That's what I'm saying. What? Jeez, maybe our vow renewal in like 15 years. She can be invited. She can be invited. We'll invite She's her. actually coming to the honeymoon. Oh, is she? We'll have a book all. <laughs> Come to the honeymoon. <laughs> Send her, a, send her an invite. Hey, yes. you want to come on a Disney cruise with hey, us? Hey, Rebecca Yaros, if you're keen, come to our honeymoon. <laughs> also, if you want to like, send a me great in advance, vacation. read a copy of Onyx Storm, I'm all ears. All happy to read before yeah. and give you um, and, feedback. Thank and you. And boys, reading is not just for the ladies. No. It is fantastic to read books. I got a book this week. Your book is like not a book. Yeah, but guess who read it? You did. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, did, I didn't read any of it. You read it to me. So Jay bought a book of poems. It's poems by a comedian. Yes. Um, and apparently, I was just got home and I was while he was cooking dinner. I was just reading them because I thought they were interesting. I was like, oh, they're funny, sure. They're quite. Funny. And apparently, the way that I was reading them out loud is exactly how the comedian would do it yes so yeah. then that was just my job was to read them all out loud yeah. um so the book the book was marlon brando 911 by james donald Forbes mccann and i kid you not <laughs> like i need to yeah because you read you read it out the exact same way it's meant to be so you're welcome <laughs> um <laughs> you're, he, <laughs> what's the, the he's not an athlete he's an artist what's that no what you, what's the, i don't know what you're talking about ron weasley when he talks about victor crumb He's uh, he's more than a more than a Quidditch face an artist. Oh, dude, I'm gonna mess that up so much. I don't so know tired. what quote you're even talking about. When they're in the giant tent that's actually really tiny, and Fred and George are like picking on him. Must be a movie. Only he's more quote. than a something. He's an artist. Yeah, it's a movie quote. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We're talking books, and Ash is in book mode. <laughs> I forgot. I'm in book mode. You're like boom, <laughs> book mode. Dum. I haven't yeah. watched the movies in a very long time. Actually, it's probably probably due. Yeah, we're probably due for, for that one of rewatch. Those, um. But yeah, so very <clears throat> intrigued. I have read now. I have consumed Fourth Wing three times. I've read it twice and listened to it once in the audiobook. And then I have consumed Iron Flame twice. I tell you what, so I'm, and I've personally listened to the dramatized audiobook of Fourth Wing. Yes. And You're close a- to the first half of yeah. Iron Flame. But I think between – because the first half of Iron Flame Dramatized audiobook has been released and then the rest of it gets released later in the year. I think we might have talked about this in on July. an earlier podcast. I think it comes next month. Oh, that'll be – oh, never mind. My, my plan I was going to put out there to the world is I wouldn't be too disappointed if I had to listen to Fourth Wing again 
in between that coming out. But if it's only coming out next month, I probably haven't yeah. got time for that. And also, I've got a list but, of books that have dramatized dramatized adaptations that I need you to listen to. Thanks. Oh, uh, thanks. I've already told you, you need to listen to A Court of Thorns and Roses yeah, in that, that series. Um, and they have dramatized audio. And at the end of the year, I'm pretty sure the first Throne of Glass audiobook dramatized edition comes out. And that is my favorite series of all time. Yes. And if you listen to a, thro- a Court of Throne and Roses audiobook, you'll understand the Bat Boys. I was going to say, yeah, we talked the about Bat the Bat Boys in the introduction. The what Bat was Boys. The Bat Boys. That's Throne of Glass. The Bat Boys are from Throne of Glass. Right. No, no. They're from A, a Court of Thorns and Roses. Sorry. Court of Thorns and Roses. So which is the same author. Same right? author, different series. Right. Okay. Um. So sh- the, the author is Sarah J. Mass. She is an icon. Um, so she has three different series. They're all in the same kind of universe though. So they all have the same law mm-hmm. of fae and fairies and all the law is exactly the same. It's all fantasy. Law as in L O R E, as in like the way things work in that universe, that's all the same between the three. So yeah. um there's the Throne of Glass series, which is completed. It's eight books. Um and that's just a masterpiece in itself, especially when you think of the fact that she started writing Throne of Glass when she was 16 years old. That's pretty cool. Which is insane. I read Throne of Glass and I go, how did a 16-year-old write this? Right. And it only got better. It's just insane. Um, that's the book that I've cried to, like that series. <laughs> cried multiple times <laughs> reading that because it was just so good. And I'm going to be sad if you do not have the same reactions. I will not cry to the book. I know I'll tell you won't you cry, now. but like I hope, I hope you get attached to the characters like I do. I mean, even with Fourth Wing, with uh, Fourth Wing, <laughs> <laughs> even with Fourth Wing, there's some characters, and you just you you relate to them. You go, oh, I hope I've got those qualities yeah. of that character or whatever. Like, who's your favorite character in Fourth Wing? Zayden. Really? Yes. My favorite character is Riddick. I like Zayden. He's very he's funny, uh, he's strong. Clown. I know that, but I don't like. You don't I don't, like I don't the way look up to his, him. yeah, I don't look up to his character. I don't go like, oh, you're, I just think he's, he's a badass pretty, he's character. He's pretty sassy. Yeah. Like he's but clips. I'm definitely not a Zayden is what I'm saying. No. I, I'm I not saying like, this. oh, I affiliate, because I just talked about affiliating with a character. Yeah. I told you this the other day when we're sitting, waiting for the panel to start. I, said, I haven't learned enough, of, enough about, who, who did you say I'm like? I said, um, I just said you're like a golden retriever. Right. In human form. Which... Did you say that's a character? Um, well, Riddick is kind of like that, but he's like the jokester. Um, right. I think. Oh, so I'm not a jokester. You know what? I actually. Oh, so think- I'm not a jokester. Hang oh. on, <laughs> hang on. I would say that you are not a jokester. We're still here. I'm awake. So I would say I would actually. You haven't really had much to do with this character because you haven't read Iron Flame. Yeah, no. Um, but that's I think I, mean. I think you're really close to like Arik. So, which oh, is Arik. the prince in disguise. Yes. So, Arik, I think he's like what he says. I sit there and I go, then <laughs> Jay would say that. Mm. <laughs> like, so. Is he a good character? Though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. he's pretty cool. So, he's like a mix between like Riddick and Sawyer. Cool. If you know who Sawyer is. Can you remember Sawyer? He's the barely. Other, he's the other guy in the, like their trio I can of barely. friends. So, yes, but. Back to Sarah J. Mass. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry, that was, a real, that. that was a real quick sidestep. Um, there's Throne of Glass, which is a completed series, eight books. There is A Court of Thorns and Roses, which is unfinished at this point in time. Okay. So there is, but the universe in itself is unfinished. So there's um, three books, the first three books in A Court of Thorns and Roses they focus on the main character, Feyre. And then 3.5 is a novella, so it doesn't really count as like a full book. It's kind of like a holiday episode. It literally make is over like their winter solstice, which is Christmas for them. Right. Um, it's literally a holiday episode. It's half a book <laughs> for a holiday <laughs> episode. and But that is the shift between Feyre being the main character and her sister Nesta being the main character. Right. Because then num- number four is her book. Yes. So technically it there's some people say it's five, some people say it's four. It's definitely four because the novella is three point five. Um, so everyone's hoping that she's like she has said that Ak- 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 Akatar is not finished. Right. Um and everyone's Akatar waiting. being a court oh. of thorns and roses. Yes. Um, so number five should come out hopefully very soon. 
Oh my goodness. Um, and then she has the Crescent City series, which only has three books so far, not finished. Um, I have not read them yet. They are so lore heavy that you yeah. have to be on to read them. You have to be switched on. I would like to, if they, if if Sarah J. Mass ever had a Q and A, I'd like to even go to that. I because I would, have fun. You would be fighting for your life to get a ticket to that. Oh yeah, <laughs> like very popular or whatever. Um, but I would just like to hear why. Like, how hard is it to write? Like, so you know all the lore to the both different series or whatever. Yeah. How hard is it to switch between writing a book for this one and then writing a book for this one? Yeah. So, that's very interesting because they all happen. So, apparently, they're the same universe, but they happen in different timelines. Yeah. So, like, there's so many theories out there, but um, Crescent City is, like, present day, but in the lore. So, mm-hmm. it's, like in a city with, like, technology and stuff, but it still has the law of, like, fae and fairies and the hierarchies and, and all that like kind that. of stuff. Right. So, whereas the other ones are completely separated. Yes. Like, whole different ball game. I think you – I know you want me to read it so bad. And I will. I will listen to it. That's what I'm saying. With my whole intent. Yes. But I feel like I'm still going to, like, fourth wing more, and the boys can relate to this. There's a reason boys like Goblet of Fire – and I know you say it's like the worst movie, only because it doesn't match the book. But there's yeah, a reason. 100%. I, I, like it was, yeah. It's because the director deliberately didn't read the book. Yeah, but even the book, like the book, is still my favorite. And I think it's the the game aspect in competition. And I think the reason is, I is like that why Fourth you like Wing Hunger Games as well. And Fourth Wing, because Fourth Wing is what's what did they say? Hunger Games meets Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. Which only because the yeah I don't get that. But on the back I, of the book yeah. it says that there is a little bit of like smuttiness but, yeah, it's, but it's not very tame. not 50 shades it's very tame um i think it's meant to be like morally gray character. and it's very like sprinkled in there's not no i don't like three, i don't think it's the smut four. jay i think it's the i think it's the morally it's the gray tension. lead it's the no it's the morally gray lead of zayden versus mr gray i don't get they're it. the same kind of they're as rebecca was saying in her panel she was saying that she made zayden as a true morally gray character morally gray yeah morally gray so they're not like the guy? They're not like fully bad and then fully well. Oh, right. Morally. Yeah. Morally. Yeah. Moral. Like uh, your morals. I'm dead in the head. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 No, like, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So he's, Mr. He's, Mr. Gray in Fifty Shades yeah. is a fully morally gray morally, character. Because he blurs the line between uh-huh. ethically sane. And Zayden's the same. So I think that's where the comparison is. Yes. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So but I think that's that's what I mean. Like, um, but I think that's why. I like that so much is because you do get that competition aspect and they're all fighting for the chance to become the writers and whatever and yeah. So can I just say that the first Throne of Glass is all based on a competition? All right, good. A king's so competition. I will like it. And, and <laughs> no, I'm not saying I will so, play it, but so it'll be good. Just a basic kind of rundown, kind of spoiler free, um, just a big overview of Throne of Glass is – in the first Stone of Glass, there's a big king's competition for the king's champion. It's kind of common knowledge. You can read that on the blurb. Um, but <laughs> it kind of is all arcing towards a like a war. So there's always a war going on. And it's like the build up from like the tensions brewing all the way until the end of the war in the last book. Gotcha. So gotcha. you'll still get a lot of that that aspect of like strategy and all that kind of stuff and the ranks and all that kind of stuff. And then even the same with Akatar, um, the first book is the main character has to go through these trials and everyone has to watch kind of them go through these trials and stuff mm. in a new system. And then it's the same kind of thing of there's there's a big bad that they have to beat and there's a war in that. Yeah. Like yep. one of the books is literally called A Court of War and Ruin. <laughs> oh, cool. So. See, that's going to be ruinous and uh, war. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> there's, <laughs> yeah, so there's A Court of Thorns and Roses, A Court of Mist and Fury. Fury. Sorry, it's not um, War and Ruin. It's A Court of Wings and Ruin. Ah. Oh, um, and then the last one is A Court of Silver Flames, which is Nesta's book. But, yes. So, yes, there's, it's very intriguing. Um. And I think anyone should read them. 
I would recommend reading Throne of Glass, then Akatar, then Crescent City. Okay. That's there we what, go. That's, well, you've heard that's it. That's what I would say. You heard it here first. Yes. Yeah. Um, if anyone wants to talk books, I am all ears. Currently, I just talk to my best friend about it and we constantly talk about it. Yeah. Happy to talk to anyone about it. If anyone wants to jump if on the podcast. If anyone wants to. Talk, oh <laughs> talk about books. If anyone wants to jump on the podcast and talk about books, I would die. Yeah. So far, we, we might have, we should have called this the books and bikes. Books and bikes. Tune in next episode when we call it the books and bikes podcast <laughs> and rebrand. No. <laughs> the story of books and bikes. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah, so I could talk about books all day. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. But we've got some fun stuff coming up. Yeah. And we still have to talk about music. We haven't had a music episode. Yeah. I literally have a degree in music and I haven't even talked yeah, about music And I'm music wearing yet. a t-shirt of one of my favorite bands. And I, I don't, got you. And you got it for me. And I don't wear band t-shirts. Yeah. So. I know it just next, looks like I'm wearing a dirty t-shirt for those that are watching the video. It's not dirty. It's pattern. <laughs> it's just how it is. Um, so in the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about music. If anyone has any specific things they want us to talk about, please let us know. Um, but next week, I think we're going to have some more guests on the podcast. Yeah, hopefully some more guests because we got some folks staying with us. Yeah, so the uploads might be a little bit chaotic in the next couple of weeks purely because for the next three weeks, we have family yeah. staying with us um, I mean, and visiting, which is going to be so much fun. But also, yeah. I don't know how much we'd be able to record. I know we'll definitely be able to get one out with our friends and Jay's brother and my best friend. We'll get an episode filmed with them. Hopefully, they'll be down for it, which will be really fun. Be and really it will fun. be chaotic. There will be four of us and, and two microphones. Two microphones, but yeah, also, we can set up a third. I got a third, but but also like four chaotic personalities in one space. Yeah. So it'll be very fun. Um, I'll just have to set them up as room mics. Wouldn't that be cool? We just yeah, phase it out. And, true, yeah, oh, yeah, that'd yeah. Be cool. Um, and then it'll probably sound like shit. Sorry, guys, I won't actually do that. No, we won't do that. <laughs> and then yeah, so. Hopefully, we still get one out a week, but we'll have to keep you posted with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Super Thanks keen. for tuning in because we love doing this, yeah. honestly. And, it's and, been so fun. Yeah. And, it, and for us, it's filled in that hole of radio that we missed. Oh, 100%. Because we used to be on the radio and then we moved. Oh, well, we stopped our show way before we moved. But uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we just kind of fell out of that. And yeah, it's super fun. I like that we can just put our phones down and yeah, I like listen. it. And we didn't even do. Topics. You know what we didn't do? What we're gonna switch this one up because we never did it. What's your good versus bad for the week? I kind of told you already. You kind of told me. Yeah, my good versus bad is kind of the same thing. All right, cool. Is like. Do you want to actually lay it out? Oh yeah, sure. So my <laughs> good versus bad is kind of good and bad at the same time. Um. I have been absolutely grinding for the last month mm -hmm. and working in a butt ton to then have some time in the next couple of weeks to enjoy having family. And I'm so excited that we're having so many people come up and visit us back to back to back. And that's so excited. I'm so excited to fill my cup with their love and their happiness and being around them and the family and everything because we kind of really do miss that. Um, but I'm also already so exhausted from starting a new job and working my other jobs at the same time. And then also we're not going to stop for the next three weeks. So like yeah. I'm simultaneously, everyone's been asking, oh my God, are you so excited for them to come? And I'm like, yes, I'm so excited. And when they're here, I am going to be so excited. And I'm not even going to think about how tired I am. But right now I am almost dreading how tired I'm going and how chaotic yeah. the next couple of weeks are going to be. And that's not being ungrateful. That's me purely being, holy crap, we are not going to stop for the next three weeks. This is going to be chaos. Like for I think the last people leave on the 18th of July. From the 18th of the July until the 1st of August, do not talk to me. Yeah. We will be in conservation mode of like recuperating our energy. Yeah. Yeah. That's my good first bad. That's very good. Like, I'm so excited. And I know it's going to be, like, the best time. Yeah, it's very exciting. And it's going to be so much fun. And we're going to be doing so much cool stuff. But also, I'm like, when are we going to sleep in all of yeah. that? <laughs> it's going to be, like, it's it's like you've got to, you got to, you're already accepting the consequence that you're going to be so wrecked. Yeah, exactly. So drained socially or whatever for a few weeks. Yeah. But having family up for the first oh, time in a so long time it. is going to be so fun. 
Um, for me, I'm going to switch mine up. I'm going to say my bad first. The Jeep's been a bit bruised this week. No, oh, poor She's, Jeep. She hasn't, I didn't, didn't get in an accident. Does she have a name yet? The Jeep. No, that's yeah. it. <laughs> that's the Jeep. <laughs> the Jeep. No, well, because no, no. I, I have know. a Peugeot and it's called Peggy. Peggy the Peugeot. Uh, Gemma? Jemima? Ew. No, no. I'm, Jemima I don't find, the Jeep. I don't find the name gross. I'm just trying to think. Jemima She the doesn't Jeep? look like a Jemima. I don't know. I, I don't know, but anyway, she's been a bit rude. If you, if you have a name for us, throw it in the comments. Oh, my God, please. Name the Jeep. I know there's a lot of car dudes that it watch this. It should be this, Ducky. So. Ducky? Ducky the Jeep. Because they're the ducks. See, I've always wanted to, but with the ducks, I've always wanted to call it the quack addict. Because, you know, she's got That's a few. That's terrible. She's a bit rough around the edges. No, well, it's a work in progress. Work we'll in get, progress. We'll the quack it. addict is not yet fully locked in. Anyway, we're going to lock that in on a later episode. But for now, I'm going to go to my good and say, um, yeah, I think that like the week's been really good. Work's been really busy, which is like in a good way. There's heaps of work to be done and it's oh, always yeah. good fun. And I have a really fun job and I love it. Um, and all the people there are really cool. And they listen to the podcast. Thanks thanks for listening to the podcast, fans. Friends? Fans? Are you guys fans? I don't know. Not fans, listeners. No. All right, fans. Um, yeah, and I don't know. I've just been having a really good week. And I got back into like, Starting to do some coding. It's that time of year. I want to do some more coding. And we have some like worksheet stuff on Excel that I want to do. And oh, there's so much cool stuff happening. I don't think you would find that really interesting. What? I was talking about Excel because I have to make a lot of things for work in Excel and Google Sheets and stuff. And I'm so And I was excited. telling Jay about it the other day and he's like, oh my God, can I work on it with you? Yes. And I'm like, if you want, like I'm getting paid to, but if you want to, like sure. I was literally before we were on the podcast, Ashley only just got home from work and then we set up the podcast. I didn't have the podcast set up because I was coding on Excel. Yeah. With VBAs. I literally, <laughs> I walked in the door and just because we talked about recording the podcast and I literally, I walked in the door and I walked into the room and I was like, so are we podcasting or what? And he's like, oh, yeah, I totally forgot. I was so excited about doing this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yep. Okay. And now coding has like totally changed the way it works because ChatGPT just not ruins it, but it's the learning aspect of it is like, oh, cool. You watch some like video for an hour. Like, oh, cool. All right. I'll replicate that. And then you learn your own things and you go, oh, that's really cool. Oh, but I don't know how to do this. I'll chuck it in ChatGPT and see if it knows. Blah, 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 blah. And then it just does your code times 2000. Anyway, wow. weird experience. But okay, cool. That's a bad part of that. Good. Anyway. But yeah, we'll talk to you next week. That's us. Let us know if you have anything to do like, and you want to chat and you have any topics or queries mm. or comments or concerns. Um, if you want to choose the color of our background, you can do that. Yeah, feel free to want. comment a good color. Yeah. And also this week... I am going to set up the Instagram account and it'll be snippets of the shows before they're released and just daily kind of, or not daily, but like updates of the podcast, things that we talk about will be put up there being like, oh, if we talked about it from this episode, go and find it on the Instagram or whatever. Um, so that should be up and running this week or next week, hopefully. Did you see, weird side note, did you see I put up a short on our YouTube channel? No, I didn't, but I, I, <laughs> I made one of like, just to see, because I see shorts, all, oh, everyone sees shorts Yeah, all they're the time. pushing shorts. Like, so I was like, oh, I'll try and make us one. I made it. It actually turned out really cool. You'll really enjoy it. Yeah. So that's what we need to put on the Instagram. Right. Okay. But cool. we can talk about this later. Anyway. All right. Bye. Yeah. Anyway, have fun. Have a great week. Bye. <laughs>